In the 13th century, the Italian explorer Marco Polo claimed that there was a bird living in Madagascar that was so big and powerful that it could snatch up an elephant in its talons and fly away with it. It is possible that the inspiration for this legendary bird of prey was a distorted account of a real bird that once lived in Madagascar, or of its giant eggs that were 200 times the size of a chicken egg, and may have been traded between sailors and Madagascan locals. But these eggs were not laid by a large bird of prey. Madagascar had no large grazing hoofed herbivores in its isolated ecosystem, and instead a giant bird filled the niche of large herbivore, the half a ton Apionis, or because of Marco Polo's story, the elephant bird, that weighed five times as much as an ostrich, and was only one of many animals that showed how evolution had taken a different turn here. Madagascar is separated from Africa by 250 miles of ocean, which is about 10 times the difference between Britain and mainland Europe for comparison, and it has been secluded like this since before the dinosaurs died out 80 million years ago. This long-term isolation has allowed its animals to evolve completely separate from other continents, and has cultivated Madagascar's famous unique ecosystem, with 80-90% to of animal and plant life not being found anywhere else in the world. Madagascar used to be part of the giant southern supercontinent Gondwana, but broke away as part of the tectonic plate that makes up India and Pakistan. This tectonic plate travelled north where it eventually crashed into Asia about 25 million years ago, forming the Himalayas. But when this plate was closer to Africa, a landmass broke away, creating Madagascar, meaning that Madagascar is technically a little bit of Asia that just happens to be Africa's largest island. Because Madagascar used to be connected to Gondwana, and has been in isolation for so long, it was thought that the unique plants, like the strange baobab trees and some animals, were ancient relics left over from when it was part of Gondwana. This is now known not to be the case, and actually Madagascar's flora and fauna is mostly made up of descendants of animals that migrated here and then colonised the islands over the past 40 million years or so so its ecosystem is a mixture of different species that originate from all over the continents that border the Indian Ocean, and then have had the chance to spread out and evolve in an insular environment. Madagascar also has a very diverse climate for such a small landmass. There are hot and humid winds battering the west side of the islands, but that are halted at the country's highlands. This has made the east side of the island into a hot and humid jungle, but the west side dry and littered with deciduous trees and the south of the island is very dry, with some parts even being considered deserts. There are also environments that are completely unique to Madagascar, like the spiny forests that are found on the southern tip. The travelling animals that found themselves on Madagascar had many different habitats to evolve into, so animals are very different from one area of the island to the other, and is why Madagascar is sometimes referred to as the world's eighth continent. Not too long ago, Madagascar also had its own megafauna, distinct from the ones that could be found in other parts of the world. By being an isolated environment, Madagascar was protected from a lot of factors that led to the extinction of the megafauna in South America and the Northern Hemisphere. One of these being humans, which Madagascar didn't have until as recently as 1500 years ago, being one of the last places in the world to be inhabited by people. This meant that Madagascar's megafauna died out much more recently than in other parts of the world. The largest animal that ever lived in Madagascar was the elephant bird. It was a ratite, which is the family that contains all the famous flightless birds like ostriches and emus. Although you might think that the elephant bird's closest relative might have been an ostrich due to its large size and that they live in Africa, a study on the DNA of elephant bird bones has found that their closest living relatives are actually the kiwi which is not only a tiny bird, but also 7,000 miles away. The ratite family has many strange relationships like this, making their evolutionary history quite puzzling. However, the popular theory is that ratites were mostly able to fly around 50 million years ago, where they flew to these sparse and isolated islands they have been found on, like New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand and Madagascar. It is thought that 50 million years ago one of these flying ratite ancestors landed in Madagascar, where due to less competition they became giants, being the island's main large herbivore, filling a niche similar to an elk or a deer. It is thought that these giant birds fed out on open plains and light forests, and had not evolved for dense jungle living like a cassowary or some species of moa. But Madagascar had a different herbivore that was doing this job, of prowling the jungles for food, miniature hippos. 
The Malagasy hippo was a tiny species of hippo that was probably quite similar in size to the pygmy hippo that is found in East Africa. So opposite to the elephant birds, the hippo shrank down significantly from their mainland relatives. This dwarfism might have been due to Madagascar being a smaller landmass, meaning that the hippos weren't able to obtain as much food, but it could have also been that the hippos didn't need to be as big because there were less large predators on the island. And this would make a lot of sense because these hippos were much better adapted to walking and running on land than other hippos, and probably spent a lot more of their time out of the water. So it seems that due to less competition in Madagascar, these hippos took to the land and started living a lot more like cows than hippos. It isn't really understood how these hippos got there, but they must have come over from Africa. Seeing as they are semi-aquatic, it is possible that they may have swum over. However, long distance ocean swimming is not a behaviour seen in current hippos, so it seems unlikely they would be able to make a 250 mile trip in one go, or would have even tried to. It is possible that the island hopped across from Comaros, which would have divided the journey up nicely, although hippo remains would need to be found there to know for sure. The alternative way they could have got across the ocean is that they may have made the trip during the ice age, when sea levels were much lower, narrowing the channel. Although there are less and fewer large carnivores in Madagascar than in Africa, they are still here, the largest being the Nile crocodile, which is actually a very recent settler and likely only colonised the island after the extinction of another giant crocodile unique to Madagascar as little as 2000 years ago. It was called the Voe and would have been around 5 metres long, meaning if it was still alive it would have been among the largest crocodiles. Interestingly, it was a horned crocodile as well, with two horns on the back of its skull. However, the largest terrestrial carnivore in Madagascar is the Fusa, which despite its cat-like appearance is not related to felines, and its closest non-Madagascan relative are actually mongoose. This is because a small mongoose-like carnivorous mammal must have found its way to Madagascar about 25 million years ago, when the island was closer to Africa. With a low amount of predators on the island, the Fusa evolved to fill the niche of the apex predator, meaning the Fusas are basically giant mongoose. This small prehistoric mongoose-like animal is also thought to be the ancestor of all of Madagascar's predatory mammals that belong to a family known as Eupleridae. Because there weren't many predators on Madagascar, this small mammal from Africa rapidly evolved to fill the ecological role that are filled by cats and dogs in other parts of the world. The Fusa not only fills the same niche that a feline would fill in other parts of the world, but has also convergently evolved with them. It looks like a small mountain lion and has even evolved retractable claws independently from felines, as mongoose do not have them. These retractable claws were an adaptation that the Fusa made to get better at climbing trees so they could hunt one of the most popular food sources in Madagascar, lemurs. The lemurs were one of the first animals to end up in Madagascar, so it makes sense that when a predator also came to the island, they would be one of the first animals to end up on the menu. This was the same as with the recently extinct bird of prey, known as the Malagasy crowned eagle. Some living birds like the harrier hawk sometimes hunt small lemurs, but the Malagasy crowned eagle was much larger, and it's possible that this was the bird Marco Polo was talking about and not the elephant bird. This eagle was a descendant of the African crown eagle that came over to Madagascar and found an insular environment inhabited by monkey-like animals, so it became a dedicated lemur killer. The African crowned eagles hunt monkeys in Africa, and lemurs probably needed very similar tactics to catch, so the bird would have been right at home. Interestingly, many large species of lemur that are too big to be eaten by any of Madagascar's currently living birds of prey still give out warning calls, which is probably something they learnt to do when they were at risk of being hunted by the Malagasy crowned eagle, and have just never lost this behaviour. Lemurs have been in Madagascar for almost twice as long as the Fusa and its other family members, with the most distantly related Madagascan lemur families diverging from each other about 40 to 50 million years ago, giving a rough date for when they arrived. Lemurs are known as Sterepsorine primates, which are primates that still have wet noses, making them look a lot more like primitive primates than monkeys do. The wet-nosed primates on most continents around the world, like lorises or galagos, are usually few in number and only occupy nocturnal niches, with their habitats being dominated by monkeys. So Madagascar has been a safe haven for these more primitive looking primates. Similar to a lot of other Madagascan animals, the lemurs must have come over from a neighbouring continent on a raft of leaves, most likely Africa. In the case of lemurs, this can actually be better explained than with a lot of other animals that made the trip because some nocturnal lemur species, like the mouse lemur, are heterothermic. 
This means they are able to drastically reduce their metabolism and live off their fat reserves for some period of time. If a lemur was stuck out at sea, it would probably instinctively start to shut its body down and would be able to survive the journey until washing up in Madagascar. The problem is that not all lemurs have this trait, and the closest relative to lemurs, lorises, which are found in Asia, do not have it either. So it is possible that being heterothermic is something that a few lemur species have evolved to deal with the harsh climate on Madagascar, and did not have it before arrival. The diverse climate on Madagascar has massively influenced the evolution of lemurs to the point where their diversity rivals that of all monkeys in the rest of the world combined. Also, similar to the Fusa, lemurs were colonising an island that had low competition, and therefore evolved to fill many niches that would be filled by non-primates elsewhere. Lemurs, like the Ai, Ai act similar to a woodpecker, using their long finger to get at insects inside the trees, and the smallest species of lemur is a third of the size of the smallest species of monkey, meaning they occupy much smaller niches. And up until fairly recently, at least one extinct species of lemur would have eaten like a grazing hoofed mammal, Megalodapus. Megalodapus was a very unique lemur that probably lived a lot more like a koala or sloth, very rarely leaving the trees and had a strange skull shape that was different from any living lemur or even primates. Its eyes were on the side of its head and it had a long cow-like jaw. Based on its skull shape and the type of wear found on its teeth, it is thought that Megalodapus ate an almost exclusively leaf diet, whereas most lemurs today eat mostly fruit, seeds or insects. Megalodapus was also a giant. The largest lemur today is the Indri, which can reach weights of 10 kilos, but Megalodapus was thought to be around 50 kilos, and it wasn't the only giant lemur, or even the largest. There was the giant Ai Ai, that was about 5 times the size of the living Ai Ai, and Archaeolemur that had a body shape that showed it spent a lot of its time on the ground, but was probably still well suited for climbing. It most likely lived like a baboon. The largest of all the giant lemurs was Archaeondorus, that may have been only slightly smaller than a gorilla, and had a body shape like one too. Although its skull was quite different, it had short hind limbs and relatively large forelimbs, meaning it probably walked along the ground like an ape. So Madagascar, being a safe haven for the wet-nosed primates, saw them evolving in a similar way to the dry-nosed primates. However, giant ground sloths also walked a lot like apes, as well, so it is probably more accurate to say that this is the way of walking commonly adopted by animals that have tree-dwelling ancestors. Just how lemurs are hunted by the Fusa today, a few thousand years ago, Madagascar may have had a predator that was large enough to hunt the giant lemurs as well, the giant Fusa. The giant Fusa would have been around twice the size of the living Fusa, but was probably just as skilled of a tree climber. It would have been a rapacious hunter of the various large lemur species on the island, and would have been big enough to hunt juvenile giant lemur as well. Even though the giant Fusa was fairly small compared to predators in the rest of the world, being around the same size as a grey wolf, it was the king of Madagascar's habitats, being found all around the island. But around 1500 years ago, this changed, with the arrival of a new predator on the island, humans. But they did not travel the 250 miles from East Africa. The first human settlers of Madagascar actually travelled 3,500 miles from Southeast Asia. Despite the incredibly long distance between Southeast Asia and Madagascar, it has been thought that its original settlers had been Asian for a while, and this is for a few reasons. Although the Malagasy language is distinct, it borrows a lot from Asian languages like Malay or Javanese. Furthermore, there is evidence that certain crops that originate in Asia, like bananas and rice, have been grown in Madagascar for a very long time. However, all this shows is that Southeast Asia has had a pretty big historical influence on Madagascar, and this doesn't mean the original settlers of the island were Asian, as all of these things could have been achieved through trade. But findings in a study in 2012 has pushed this theory far beyond just speculation and now it is highly likely that the original settlers of Madagascar were from Southeast Asia, more specifically the Malay Archipelago. The study compared the DNA and the mitochondria of Malagasy people and Indonesian people. Mitochondria are cells that have descended from bacteria and now have a symbiotic relationship with animals. This means they have their own DNA that can be studied independently from the DNA of the animal, and in this case, the human. Adding to this, people can only inherit mitochondria from their mothers, so the DNA can't be shuffled around by sex. Which means that changes in the DNA must be from random mutations which scientists are able to account for. 
The study found that Malagasy and Indonesian DNA separated roughly around the time when archaeological evidence of humans first appeared in Madagascar. It also found that the party of people that arrived would have been pretty small, only containing around 30 women. So how did they manage to get across the Indian Ocean? Why did they even try in the first place? Or was ending up in Madagascar an accident? Society in the Malay archipelago was pretty advanced for the period when this happened, specifically in boating technology, so it was not out of the question that people from the region colonised Madagascar purposefully. However, there are reasons to doubt this. One is that there is no evidence of later voyages to the island that you would think would have followed the first boat to land, a little bit like what happened when Europeans colonised the Americas. Also, although there were many trade routes going from the Malay archipelago to India and even as far as the Middle East, there is little archaeological evidence of Austronesian people as far southwest as Madagascar, so it would be strange if people were to just arrive there one day without previously visiting the area. So it was likely an accident, and this is very feasible seeing as there was a lot of trade done with Indonesian sailors throughout the Indian Ocean, so it would be unsurprising if a group of them may have been blown off course and ended up in Madagascar. In fact, the currents in the Indian Ocean travel west, but also push south when they passed India, funneling a lot of the current towards Madagascar. However, this theory creates a bit of a mystery, because if they were not intentionally colonising Madagascar, why were there any women aboard, never mind 30, as presumably the vast majority of sailing in 500 AD was done by men, so this just adds to the mystery. Although the animals in Madagascar were definitely not helped by the arrival of humans, they did not suffer as much as animals in other isolated islands like moas in New Zealand or dodos in Mauritius. Many of the megafauna species in Madagascar like elephant birds, giant fusa and megalodapis may not have gone extinct until as little as six to 700 years ago, meaning they cohabited the islands with humans for up to a thousand years. In fact, they went extinct so recently that their bones are often discovered unfossilized. It's possible that the habitat destruction and overhunting were a big problem, but many of the giant lemur populations were dwindling before the arrival of humans. For instance, Archaeondorus may have been extinct for 500 years before anyone set foot in Madagascar. The diminishing lemur populations show that there may have been other forces at play, like climate change. The giant lemurs may have died out, but they shaped a lot of plant life on the island, meaning in many cases you can still see the gap in the ecosystem that they used to occupy. There are fruit trees that have seeds too big for any current lemur to swallow whole in order to spread them, but large lemur species like Paki lemur were probably large enough to eat them, which is why they evolved. It is also possible that the reason for Madagascar's unique spiny forest ecosystems is because of giant lemurs once living in them. Almost all of the spiny vegetation that makes up the spiny forests found in the southern portion of the island belong to a family of plants known as Didiraceae. This family of trees are found throughout Africa, but whereas the family members in mainland Africa are entirely thornless, all of these trees in Madagascar have thorns. The leaves on these trees are not really eaten by any lemurs that currently inhabit the island, so what animals are these thorns defending the leaves from? Well, there is a lot of evidence showing that recently extinct giant lemurs ate them, and so the Madagascan variety of these plants needed to evolve to stop lemurs from eating too much. Similar to how certain lemurs give warning calls to a bird of prey that no longer exists, these plants are protecting themselves from animals that are no longer alive. The relationship between plants and animals on Madagascar was also very important in developing our understanding of how evolution works. Charles Darwin was studying orchids that had been brought to him from Madagascar, and he noted the extraordinary length of their nectaries. One in particular had a flower spur measuring about 30 centimeters. He predicted that there must be a moth that had a proboscis long enough to reach down the plant's throat to get at the nectar. A few years later, Morgan's Sphinx moth was discovered that had a proboscis five times the length of its body, and the subspecies of moth was named Predictor, in light of Darwin's prediction. Madagascar may be a land of immigrants, as its population is made up of a mixture of strange versions of animals that come from different parts of the Indian Ocean, but it may be the ancestral home to some species as well. Madagascar is home to half of all chameleon species, and many scientists believe that this is where the creatures originate. Their fossil record is not very good, and other theories put their place of origin in mainland Africa, but it is possible that they evolved in Madagascar, and then migrated out to colonise the rest of the world. So Madagascar may be an island filled with evolutionary experiments, showing how different animals can evolve while in isolation, but also its unique ecosystem may have left a mark on many other parts of the world too. Thank you for watching. 
If you want to watch more videos like this, you can subscribe. And a massive thank you goes to my patrons, especially the big contributors like Sammy Voz, Grim Marshall, Green Fours, and Brandon Klopp. If you would like to support me as well, then you can go to Patreon and make a pledge.